Well, good morning, everyone. This is George Spies from the Pennsylvania Office of Open Records. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar where we're going to be discussing uh, basics of the Sunshine Act or Pennsylvania's open meetings law, as it's also known. A uh, couple preliminaries here before we dive into the uh, topic. Um, if you uh, would like a copy of the PowerPoint that we're using for this presentation, you can find it on our website. Go uh, over to the training tab on the main training page, scroll down and you'll find all of the PowerPoints that we use for these webinars and a couple extras as well. You're welcome to download those, use them for your own reference, or if you're doing any localized training, feel free to uh, uh, you know, plagiarize us and uh, hopefully that will be of some use to you. Uh, this session is being recorded so that if you have colleagues who couldn't make it or if you have to leave early for whatever reason, uh, what you can do is uh, send us a, a uh, flash drive with a return stamped envelope and a note saying what you know what you want. And uh, we're more than happy to uh, make a copy of the recording for you and mail it back to you. Lately, the turnaround time is about a week. Uh, we would love to be able to post these online or email them, but the file size is so big that it just doesn't make it through uh, our, our email protocols and there's you know security concerns and so forth with files being so big. So uh, we are exploring some file sharing software, but again, uh, there are some security concerns that need to be addressed. Um, so in the meantime, feel free to send us a flash drive and, and we're more than happy to accommodate you with uh, making the recording and sending that back to you. Uh, as far as questions go today, you know, these sessions are interactive. Uh, feel free to type in your questions in the uh, meeting chat feature and I'll do my best to answer them as we're going along. A uh, couple things, you know, we are talking about the Sunshine Act today, so please keep your uh, comments limited to that general topic. Um, also, try to keep your questions as brief as possible. Uh, occasionally, some people will type in you know, several paragraphs, and it, it just gets awkward for me to uh, sit here and read it while everyone else is patiently waiting. And uh, you know, kind of the worst fear of anyone who's working in radio is what they call dead air. And uh, you know, I, just, I just feel uncomfortable with that. If you do have a question that appears to be unusually complex, or uh, you know, specific to your particular situation, we'll do one of two things. We'll either wait until the end of the presentation and I'll come back to it, or we can take the conversation offline. Uh, the uh, contact information for our office is on the screen now. Feel free to call in or uh, go to the website. We have email accounts that you can use. Shoot us an email. It usually is, is directed to me and uh, we'll do our best to uh, get you pointed in the right direction with whatever situation that you're dealing with. Okay, and then finally, one last caveat is um, this topic uh, and this presentation tends to jump around a little bit, and you'll see the logic. Um, there, there is a lot to absorb with the Sunshine Act, but our effort here in the next hour or so is to hit upon the main points that as public officials, as members of the public, as public employees, you should be aware of, okay? There are uh, other aspects of the Sunshine Act that you know, occasionally will come up, but we're hitting on the main points here uh, so that you'll leave here with a firm foundation as to what's expected uh, when we conduct a public meeting. Okay, that's all the preliminaries. Let's dive into the presentation. Um, here we go. All right, Sunshine Act, Pennsylvania's open meetings law. I really enjoy starting with, the, you know, what we'll call a preamble. This is taken right out of the law. And, you know, this is important. This is an important topic because it really represents democracy at its at its best. You know, this is, I, I admit I'm being somewhat altruistic here, but you know, working in open records, working with government transparency, uh, strangely, I get excited about it. So um, uh, this preamble kind of addresses it all, and it's the public's right to be present at all meetings 
and witness the deliberation, policy formulating, formulation, and decision making of our public officials. And that secrecy in public affairs undermines faith in public government right there, okay? And that, you know, this is critical uh, to our role in a democratic society. Okay, so, you know, like I said, somewhat altruistic, but I think that just cuts right to the heart of the matter as to why it's so important that we have this act and that we have open meetings. I've broken it down into what we call the big three, okay? And when someone calls with a question or sends us an email about, you know, the legality of actions taking forth with a meeting or gathering, um, this is what I look at, okay? Number one is that there needs to be advance notice to the public that the meeting is occurring and instructions on how they can attend. And then the public has a right to observe the deliberations that are taking place amongst our public officials. And finally, they have the right to comment on those deliberations and uh, prospective votes prior to decisions taking place. All right, questions popped up here already. What are the restrictions and regulations regarding amending? Yeah, I'm gonna get to that, Miss Friends. You're way ahead of me. Just, you know, calm down, be patient, and uh, we'll get to it, and I'll make sure to answer uh, those questions. Okay, so these are the big three, and I'm gonna make sure that this is what we cover during the, uh, the presentation. All right, so let's jump in and talk about specifically jurisdiction and who is covered by the Sunshine Act. And uh, we put this in here because questions often come up about committees. Okay, so let's take a look at the act itself. And whenever you're you know, attempting to educate yourself on a law, I always recommend be sure to look at the definition section because a lot of times that can fill in the gaps and provide you with a lot of insight as to how a particular law operates. And the Sunshine Act is no different. So when, when we ask the question, who is covered by the Sunshine Act, I think it's best to go to the definition section to kind of fill in the gaps there. What the act itself says is that it applies to any state or local government body and all committees. Notice committees is italicized there because, like I said, this question comes up a lot. Is our committee subject to sunshine? Okay, so then we come to the next part of this definition in that that perform an essential government function. So let me talk about that for a moment because this is a somewhat subjective term. What is an essential government function? Well, let, let me throw out an example here. Let's say that our local girls softball team has won the state championship. Okay, big accomplishment. So our, our board of supervisors appoints an ad hoc committee to organize a celebration. You know, maybe it's a, a parade, maybe it's, a, you know, a carnival of some sort or a community gathering. And this committee needs to meet in order to organize the event. All right, now, as important as this is to the community in recognizing the accomplishments of the girls softball team, I don't think we could argue that it's an essential government function. All right, so chances are that ad hoc committee would not be subject to the Sunshine Act. But if we change this up a little bit, let's say that the same Board of Supervisors appoints a committee to review all of the local ordinances to make sure that they are still um, uh, you know, up to date, that the language is appropriate, uh, that there's truly a need for the ordinance to still be in force. Okay, that's actually a statutory function. And it would be, I think you could successfully argue that the meetings of that committee would be subject to the Sunshine Act because of it's essential to government functions that all of the local ordinances are in fact relevant. So hopefully you can see the distinction there between the two examples as to why with the first, the girls softball team recognition would not necessarily be considered an essential government function, whereas the second is. And then it says, exercises authority to take official action. 
And if we look at the definitions, there's actually one in there in the Sunshine Act defining what official action is. Interestingly, as part of that definition, it uses the term making recommendations so that if you have a committee appointed by the board that ultimately is making recommendations back to the board on matters of essential government functions, then you can make that nexus that the work of this committee providing recommendations back to the main board is considered official action, thus is subject to the Sunshine Act and all of its provisions. Okay, so that's looking at the act itself and the language within, you know, defining who is covered by the act and how we go about uh, reaching the conclusions as to whether or not a committee in itself would be subject to the act using the definition section. All right, but there is some case law that covers this and it gets into it in a little greater detail. Uh, and it's interesting because there's not necessarily a lot of case law in the Sunshine Act that we can use for guidance. But the case I'm referring to is uh, Ristow versus Casey. And the question came up, you know, was uh, an ad hoc, I think it was ad hoc, was an ad hoc, ad hoc committee appointed by Governor Casey subject to uh, the Sunshine Act. And in that decision, um, there's some very useful language that, like I said, dives a little deeper into this topic. Is your committee covered by the Sunshine Act? So here are some questions that the decision addressed. The first is, does the committee have decision-making authority? Okay, and you're thinking, well, why wouldn't you have decision-making authority if you're appointed by the board. Well, a committee can be appointed simply to investigate an issue, to gather information, provide an educational function to come back to the main board without really providing any um, recommendations per se. Also, you know, the reality is that occasionally a committee will be appointed simply to make an issue go away. If a board doesn't want to deal with something or, you know, if it's a particularly sensitive issue that they want to buy some time, they'll say, well, let's appoint a committee. And they don't really give any decision making authority to that committee. Um, so in, in that instance, that sort of committee would not rise to this definition covered in Ristow versus Casey. Then the next issue that we take a look at are the members of the board or I'm sorry, are the members of the committee appointed by the board and are they authorized to act on its behalf? Now you're thinking, okay, why would there be a committee that is not appointed by the board? Well, there are some functions. Um, for instance, yesterday I did a, uh, an online training session for a library association and there are quite a few library boards that are affiliated with municipalities that are not appointed by the supervisors themselves, but rather the boards are what I call self-perpetuating. So that if there's a vacancy, it's the responsibility of the other uh, volunteer library board members to go find someone to fill the vacancy. So the board members are not appointed by the township supervisors or borough council or whatever. So there's a good example. Uh, and then authorized to act on its behalf, meaning that this committee is authorized to perform certain acts. It's not like, okay, you guys are part of this committee, but don't do anything, all right? It's, it's rather you have this authority, here's your mission, here's your task, thus you are authorized to act on the board's behalf. And then we come to the next one, which I consider the most important, the one that has the most meat to it, and that is, are the recommendations being made by the committee pursuant to statute, ordinance, regulatory authority, or whatever, whereby it ultimately results in the enactment of laws, policies, or regulations? Okay, so there's like a statutory mission, a statutory authority for this committee that defines its role. And even if it's just making recommendations, those recommendations are pursuant to statute so that it's providing guidance to the main 
board as to what course of action it should ultimately take. And I think this is a good time to revisit our girls softball team uh, example. Whereas, you know, if the ad hoc committee comes back to the main board and says, we think we should have a parade, we think we should have like an outdoor uh, carnival or something of that nature. Okay, all good recommendations, all important stuff, but yet you're not going to find a statute that dictates there should be a parade or carnival or any sort of recognition ceremony when our girls softball team wins the state championship. Okay, so you see how we kind of flesh this through using the law, using case law to arrive at a decision would our committee be covered by the Sunshine Act? And is, admittedly, some of this is still subjective because of some of these terms used. So number one, uh, as a practical perspective, because we're the Office of Open Records, obviously we're going to advise you to lean towards transparency. But then there's also a, a practical perspective to this, and it's what I call the straight face test. OK, let's say that, you know, you think uh, uh, given all this, we're going to close our committee meeting and we're just not going to let the public in, even though, you know, there are still questions as to whether that's the appropriate course of action to take. So what are the what are the possible alternatives here? Well, it may be a little, um, you know, a little inconvenient to open your meeting to the public and have to advertise, have to have a room, you know, big enough and allow public comment and so forth. Um, but the alternative is that someone would file a complaint with the local court and you would have to pass what I call the straight face test, where you stand up in front of a judge and explain why you didn't open your meeting to public access. And that could actually result in a lot more inconvenience than not opening the meeting in the first place. So if you're at all unsure as to whether your committee should be sunshine, open it up to the public, you know, our recommendation is lean towards transparency and do so. Because from a practical perspective, you're probably saving yourself a lot of work in the long run. Okay, moving on. Next, we have the question that he's answered. Is it in fact a meeting? And it I guess it's not surprising, but you would be a little surprised at how often we receive an email or a phone call from someone explaining, you know, what happened last night or what they saw. And the question is, are they allowed to do this? And the answer is yes, your borough council or supervisors are allowed to gather OK, uh, as long as they are not deliberating or decision making, meaning, you know, someone saw the township supervisors at the local restaurant eating breakfast the other day. Isn't that illegal? Well, no, it's not. OK. Um, they can meet and socialize, you know, talk about the weather, talk about their families, whatever. They just can't talk about agency business. OK, they can't talk about uh, what's expected to come up before the township and the next board meeting or, uh, you know, borough council or, or whatever. OK, they just need to be careful about what conversations take place. OK, questions popped up here. I want to make sure I don't miss it. Um, let me scroll back here and try and get this. All right. If the school board meets with township officials to go over the impact of land development, no actions recommendations come out of it. It's more of an FII. Would this qualify as a public meeting? Uh, I think you'd need to be careful about that. Uh, what it comes down to is kind of what I'm going to talk about now, the liberation. Are they talking about business that's coming before the board? Uh, as a body, they may not be able to take any official action, you know, the township supervisors uh, and the school board. However, uh, if the school board, for instance, on their own, are deliberating, meaning talking about the merits of the land purchase or land development, that could be an issue. OK, so you want to be careful with something like that. OK, let me scroll down here to make sure the way this thing works is uh, I don't want to miss any questions that come up. OK, another one here. Our solicitor says members who phone in or zoom in are not counted for a quorum. Hey, I'm going to address that right now. Very timely question. OK, so 
first question that needs answered, is there a quorum? All right, because a meeting, it, it can't be considered a meeting unless there is a quorum present. Now, to answer your question, Mr. Mack, um, let me think here. Borough, under the Pennsylvania Borough Code and first class townships, a quorum must be physically present in order for there to be any official action taking place. For other entities like second class townships, school districts and the like. OK, second class township, you can phone in to be considered present. However, the person phoning in must have direct access. They must be able to hear everybody and everybody must be able to hear the person phoning in, meaning that you would use like a uh, uh, a conference call. Or, or something like that, or you know, a Zoom platform where a speakerphone, uh, so everybody can hear everybody else. What you can't have is someone sitting there at the meeting with a cell phone up to their ear, relaying back and forth. Okay, that would not be considered consistent. Um, okay, so for boroughs and first class townships, you have to have a quorum present, and then anybody in addition to the quorum could then phone in. But for the other entities, uh, you could have someone phone in in order to make the quorum. Now, I just want to caution you a little bit because questions have come up about, well, what if every public official just phones in or we have an online meeting? Uh, that would not be considered consistent with the Sunshine Act as far as our interpretation goes. Because number one, there's language in the act that we refer to that alludes to the fact it's there's expected to be a physical presence. And number two, just in hearings that we have attended with the legislature committee, legislative committees, uh, legislators have made it abundantly clear that their expectation is that the public has the right to uh, witness and be able to uh, address their public officials directly not through an online presence, but rather, you know, in a physical meeting. So that would be, uh, you know, some direction that we would provide and a word of caution to you when it comes to having members uh, participate remotely. OK, then the next question we need to answer, is there deliberation? Again, going back to that definition uh, uh, section, Deliberation is defined as any discussion that could ultimately lead to a decision. And here we're talking about the business of the agency. So at the gathering, is there a quorum of members who are talking about the business of the municipality or the school board or the authority or whatever? That deliberation uh, can be critical as to whether or not the Sunshine Act would apply. And then the next question that's answered is, is there decision making? And essentially that's taking a vote, okay? Are the members voting on a matter of business that uh, you know impacts the public that they serve? And then finally, I just wanna caution you about what we call email meetings. And this, you know, this occurs most commonly at this time of year where you have you know a new board seated uh maybe member may yeah pardon me maybe many members of the new board come from a business background they're used to using email to uh deliberate and solve problems so the new board president not a lot of experience thinks well this is just a matter that we can solve real easily with a couple emails unfortunately if you are deliberating through the use of email, actually I shouldn't say unfortunately, if you are deliberating through the use of emails, that would represent a violation of the Sunshine Act because that deliberation must take place in a public meeting. And I'll distinguish between what we would call policy level decision making and administrative level decision making. Administrative level decision making where, for instance, let's say at the last public meeting, you took a vote, uh, and decided on a particular course of action, but now you need to work out the details. How are we going to implement this vote? Okay, that level of discussion would be administrative in nature. 
using email to address that is OK. However, issues that might not have yet come up before the board and you're expecting a vote, you don't want to have email discussions among board members uh, related to a, a prospective vote. OK, so don't do that because you could find yourselves getting in trouble and you might be thinking, well, what if we only do it one at a time? OK, and yeah, th this question is popping up. You're you're on the same page with me. Well, the, the problem is, is that if you have the same conversation, just not at the same time, you are in effect having a de facto conversation among the entire board. And it does represent deliberation. So don't try to outthink the law by having individual conversations because this has already been tried and councils have already been called out on it. OK, it, do not do it. Do not try to outthink the Sunshine Act because or really any law, because ultimately you'll get called out on it and the consequences could be, you know, at the very least embarrassing uh, for your attempt to outthink the act. OK, quick sip of water here. OK, well, what is not a meeting? Well, I already addressed the issue of administrative action versus agency business. If the board's already taken a vote and now it needs to just kind of clarify how it's going to be implemented or other uh, uh, decisions of that de minimis level, then I think you're OK. Uh, a board can have work sessions, and I think school districts are a good example here. Uh, we'll get to the penalties towards the end of the presentation. Um, I'm answering a question there. OK, so a work session typically is a gathering of the board for educational and informational purposes where the type of communication is limited. Usually what happens is the board will gather and staff members will make presentations to update and educate the board on matters of import that are expected to come up at the regular business meeting for the board to address. So they need to get background information. They need to uh, get information so that they can make informed decisions. Board members can ask questions and have discussion with the staff members. OK, back and forth to clarify issues. But the board members themselves cannot discuss the merits of what is being presented because at that point it represents deliberation. OK, so the conversation takes place between staff and board members, not among the board members themselves. OK, so that's usually what takes place at a work session, and that is OK. Conferences, same standard applies, same way with retreats, OK? They can get together and, dis and, and basically, you know, like um, for educational purposes, attend a conference that might be hosted by uh, the State Association of Boroughs or the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors. Again, all to educate themselves on, you know, the latest uh, issues that are coming up of importance uh, for townships to be aware of, local governments to be aware of, et cetera, et cetera. OK, uh, as long as they don't go to a side room or during lunch and caucus about, OK, how does this apply to our particular municipality and the issue that we're dealing with? OK, they just need to be careful about what they talk about to make sure that it doesn't rise to the definition of deliberation. If they're not deliberating, it's not considered a meeting and they don't need to be worried about that. OK, and then finally, yeah, there would not be votes taking place at these gatherings. If these elements, if any of these elements are met, um, deliberation, decision making, then that would rise to the level of a public meeting that would be subject to Sunshine Act. But if they're not deliberating, if they're not making any decisions, it would not be considered a public meeting. Okay, next one, public notice. First of the big three. The way the Sunshine Act reads, and the way it works out from a practical perspective is that three days in advance of a, the, your first regular meeting, and usually it's it's what we call your organization meeting, whether you're dealing with a calendar year, 
uh, fiscal year, business year, however you define your, uh, your year. Before your first regular meeting, at least three days in advance, you would have to have notice in a paid newspaper of general circulation, and it would be one of those uh, legal notices. Uh, a newspaper article, what's called a puff piece, would not count. Um, websites don't count, and those free sale circulars that fill up our mailboxes, they don't count. Paid newspaper of general circulation. Now, we recognize that uh, there's structural changes taking place in the news media industry that's making this requirement more problematic. But this is what the law says, and until it changes, uh, you're going to have to follow this. And because of the fact that, you know, what used to be a daily newspaper is now maybe only two or three days a week, yeah, that lead time in order to get the notice printed in the paper is going to take more, usually more than three days. All right, but you would have, typically your, your legal notice would be, you know, this is our first meeting, this is where, when, and, and you know, the date and the time where the meeting is going to occur. And then usually it lists the dates for all the rest of the regular meetings throughout the business year. Now, just as an aside, let's say you have your organizational meeting, all the officers are elected, et cetera, et cetera. But then you realize that there's going to be a conflict with schedule. So you need to change the regular uh, date for your uh, regular meeting. Let's say it's normally on the first Tuesday of the month, we're going to move it to the second Tuesday. That would require another legal notice, public note, changing from the first Tuesday to the second Tuesday. You'd want to do that. Um, and then also your notices need to be posted at the meeting site okay, to make sure that, you know, anyone who may not have seen the legal notice can stop by the township building or borough hall or whatever school district administrative building and get an idea as to when the meetings are. Now, if you want to use social media to add to this requirement, to let the public know when the meetings are scheduled, that's great. There's no prohibition against that. Okay. Hey, Josh, a uh, newspaper of general circulation must be circulated either where the agency is headquartered or where the meeting takes place virtual meetings. Does this mean we are limited to newspaper where the agency is headquartered? In general terms, Josh, yes, that would still be the requirement. That's a great question, especially because, you know, newspapers are migrating over to websites and so forth. It, it's becoming more difficult. We acknowledge that. But, you know, this is the language that the law uses. OK, so folks, uh, it's a great question and it, it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, but you want to make sure that the newspaper that you're using for your legal notices is in fact circulated to the area uh, in mo for the most part that your uh, constituency uh, resides. Uh, interesting, this, this came up yesterday with a question because there were two newspapers that serve that area. Which one should I choose? Okay, it was kind of a, uh, an academic question, but you know, we had that discussion and it was a concern. Which one has the greater circulation? Uh, is basically what was decided. Okay, so moving on from public notice, um, actually some more about public notice. The Sunshine Act also allows for special meetings. Okay, this would be where an item has come up that cannot wait until next month's regular meeting or, you know, whenever you have them. We need to address it sooner. So the Sunshine Act allows a board to convene a special meeting. And here, the advance notice, the public notice requirement, is reduced from three days to one, 24 hours. Okay, so 24 hours in advance of the special meeting, you need to have that legal notice in the paid newspaper of general circulation. And then it also allows, the Sunshine Act also allows for emergency meetings where there is no requirement for notification. And this would be, you know, I, I like to use the snowplow example. Um, we're a small borough, we only have one snowplow, the forecast is for a big storm 
and our roadmaster just informed us that the snowplow is broken down and it can't be repaired. It's so old that we can't get parts for it anymore. So there's a new snowplow sitting down in this other town on their lot. We can go buy it now, but we need board approval to do so. Okay, so the board gets together because of the emergency situation. They need a snowplow right now and they vote to approve the purchase. All right, bona fide emergency, bona fide reason for a, a, an emergency meeting. All right, don't think, and like I said earlier, don't try to outthink the Sunshine Act by creating your own emergency. Because again, you could face that, that straight face standard where you have to explain to a judge why you waited until the last minute for something like this. OK, don't try to do that, because like I said, ultimately you'll be called out on it. And then if you have to cancel a meeting, let's say someone's sick and you can't get a quorum together or, you know, weather emergency or whatever. OK, there's no requirement in the Sunshine Act that you would provide any notice of the cancellation. However, you know, as a matter of public service, I would suggest use your social media platforms to get the word out there that the meeting will be canceled. Because this comes up periodically where someone didn't know and they drove down to the township building. You know, it was crickets, lights out. There wasn't any notice on the door. They didn't find out until the next day that, oh, yeah, we had to cancel. Uh, it, you know, you're not going to make any friends doing that. You're going to upset your residents. So if, if you can use your social media to get the word out when you have to cancel a meeting, I think you're going to save yourselves a lot of, a lot of headaches in the long run. It looks like I skipped the page here. Okay, here we go. Okay, question came up earlier. What about agendas? Well, this is something relatively new to the Sunshine Act. It became effective August 29th of uh, 2021, where the legislature added some agenda provisions to the act. So let's talk about those. Essentially, what it comes down to is that all agencies must post an agenda of items that they expect to deliberate on planned official action at least 24 hours in advance of a regular or special meeting. OK, now the agenda provisions do not apply to work sessions, conferences or executive sessions, and I'll talk about executive sessions here in a little bit. Now, let me let me talk about work sessions again. The way I described a work session is that there would be no deliberation and no decision making. Occasionally, we will run across an, an instance where a municipality has, or school district has met all of the legal requirements in the Sunshine Act for a public meeting, but they call it a work session. Now, if you do that, the expectation from the public is that no decision making is going to take place. So don't try to sneak in matters of business and take a vote during what would otherwise be a public meeting, but you're calling it a work session. It's either a public meeting or it's not. So if you call it a work session, there's no public expectation that you would be voting on anything. But then if you take a vote, because you've met all the requirements of the Sunshine Act, that's somewhat duplicitous. And you don't want, again, you don't want to find yourself in that sort of situation. Um, so, you know, just a word of caution there. All right, so the other point that we want to make, you see that asterisk there. The law says websites. However, there is a trend, especially among smaller municipalities, to use Facebook as their primary social media platform and forgo any type of website. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just that if your municipality has a Facebook page and that's your primary way of informing the public, then that's where the agenda should be posted. OK, if you have both, then you have to make sure it's on the website and Facebook would be a bonus. OK. And the posting must also be at your agency offices and at the meeting site posted there. And then you have to have copies of the agenda available for the public 
at the meeting site so that, you know, it reinforces that physical presence so that they can refer to it during the meeting. Now, let's say you need to make a change to the agenda, and this specifically addresses the question that came up earlier. Here's the timeline, and the 24 hour uh, threshold is critical here. Anything before the 24 hours is fair game. If you need to amend the agenda, you're, you're able to do that without any uh, caution. Once the 24 hour period comes up, you can only change your, your agenda for what's known as de minimis items, where there would be no expenditure of funds as a result of a vote that takes place and no entering into any contracts as the result of a vote that takes place. Okay, so anything that falls below that, yes, you could amend your agenda during this 24 hour window. Now let's move up to the meeting itself. The meeting is called to order. The agenda that was previously posted can only be amended through majority vote of the board that's present. So let's say that as a result of, you know, issues that were discussed during the meeting, something comes up and it's like, we really need to address this tonight. So the way it would work is that through Robert's rules or, you know, whatever standard that you're using to conduct your meeting, the first vote would be to amend the agenda. You know, I make a motion, we amend the agenda to reflect. And the board president or chairperson or whatever needs to announce to the public why. Okay, formal reason why we are amending the agenda. And then you go through the appropriate mechanizations, you know, second discussion, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you've affirmatively voted to amend the agenda. Now you can address the specific issue that you're amending the agenda for. And you would go through the regular, uh, again, mechanizations with that. Uh, you know, I move, uh, second, discussion, public comment, and then if necessary, the vote on that particular issue. In all of this, would be then memorialized within the minutes of the meeting, reflecting the two votes that took place on this particular issue, and the amended agenda reflecting the new item that was voted on needs to then be posted within 24 hours after the meeting has occurred. Okay, now questions have come up, and you know this was from day one when this become effective. First is the easy one. Uh, when, how long must an amended agenda be posted after the meeting? We don't know, okay? It, it's not addressed in the provisions of the Sunshine Act. But I think because we're using this 24 hour standard, both before and after the meeting, 24 hours is probably a reasonable period of time that you would have this posted on your website if you have one on your Facebook page if you're using it and at the meeting site, okay? That's not what the law says, but you can kind of see how the logic that we're using to arrive at this guidance, all right? Ultimately, a court may say we're wrong, all right? But in the meantime, I think that's a reasonable standard. Then we come up to the second question, which is more difficult, and that is how detailed do our agenda items need to be? And again, the, uh, <laughs> the provisions don't address this, but we took somewhat of a leap of logic here using uh, an example that I'm gonna talk about when we get to executive sessions. Uh, there was a court case from years ago that dealt with how detailed does the reason need to be for a board to go into executive session? And that court case uh, provided some language where it said it needs to be detailed enough so that a member of the public present has a reasonable idea as to why the board is going into executive session. So I think you can kind of take that standard and apply it to agendas that a person reading the agenda has a reasonable idea 
And then if you read the decision itself, it's it's the city of Reading versus the Reading Eagle. It relies on a Supreme Court decision out of, uh, I believe it's the state of Mississippi. Um, that anyway, it it goes into saying that, look, when you're going into executive session, you're basically shutting out the public. So you need to give them enough reason to satisfy their trust, to allay any doubt that they may have. So that's a, you know, a fairly uh, comprehensive reason that you would give. Thus, your agenda item should be fairly comprehensive so that the person reading it can make an informed decision as to whether they believe I need to attend this meeting or not. All right, so you can't just say personnel issues or legal issues or something like that. Your agenda item needs to be of reasonable detail so that, again, a reasonable person can understand what the agenda item truly means and what they can expect to witness when they attend this public meeting. And when in doubt, I suggest simply going into greater detail. Now, there are some agenda items, you know, it's, it's like how specific do we need to be? Okay, like paying of the bills. Uh, some bills don't come in until, you know, right before the meeting. Do we need to then amend the agenda to reflect this new bill? You know, I, I think you've got to take a look at if it's just like a, a regular monthly bill that you get for maybe the electricity payment or something like that. No, but if it's something unique and of an unusual size or unusual set of circumstances that normally the board would not be addressing on a monthly basis, then probably, yeah, the agenda should reflect that unique action that the board would be expected to take at the upcoming public meeting. I mean, some of it is just common sense as to whether you believe the agenda needs to be amended or not. But again, err on the side of transparency with notifying the public as to what the expectations are. Uh, don't try to hide something unique, something special, something of unusual importance inside a routine agenda item. The, you know, the auspices, well, it's new business, so we'll just call it new business and let it at that, okay? Don't try to do that, okay? Because ultimately that will create more headaches than it will solve. All right, so I've, I've you know, gone into detail on, um, you know, the specific the specificity of agenda items and the posting requirements and also what you need to change. Okay, question has come up here. Um, if a school district committee meeting is not for action, but only recommendation to the whole board at a public meeting, does that committee need to post an agenda of the issues? Uh, yeah, if my take on this, and I, I would suggest having this discussion with your solicitor uh, because they're you know better informed as to the specifics of your district, but in general terms, uh, if the committee is making recommendations for board action, that would meet that definition as of official action as detailed in the sunshine language itself okay and if the committee is subject to sunshine it's then subject to all of the provisions of the sunshine including the agenda provisions so i believe that you know speaking in general terms not knowing the specifics of your district and and this particular committee uh, I would lean towards the agenda requirement and saying that um, you should post that. But again, discuss it with your solicitor just to make sure and follow the advice of your solicitor in, in these particular cases. Okay, good question. Okay, public comment, the third of the big three. As we talked about in, with the preamble to the Sunshine Act, the public has a right to comment on business that is or may be before the board. Public comment can be limited to residents and taxpayers of the municipality, of the authority, okay? This can be somewhat problematic when you're talking about a uh, municipal authority that has what we'll call rate payers that extend beyond residents and taxpayers, but to date, there's no case law that I'm aware of that addresses this, okay? And I only put that out there because the question came up earlier this week about that. But 
for our purposes, residents and taxpayers. Meaning that if you have like the resident of an adjoining municipality that comes to your public meeting and wants to address the board through the public comment period, the board can say no, because you're not a resident. Um, so they have the right to comment on issues that are or may be before the board before any pertinent votes take place. Now, what's problematic for some boards is that word may, because that kind of opens it up to really any issue that could come up. And this is where you may have that resident who's concerned about, you know, the the big pothole on his street that no one seems to you know, be preparing or whatever. It's kind of a catch all. Um, there is a practice that many uh, municipalities uh, exercise. It's not a requirement of the Sunshine Act, but let me just fill you in on this because we became aware of it and we kind of think it's a good idea and we've passed this on to some other municipalities where boards actually have two comment periods. The first one is limited to matters that are before the board at that particular moment, meaning that this issue is coming up for a vote. OK, it's it's on the dais now. So you, we're going to have public comment and it's limited to this issue. All right. And then at the end of the meeting, before it adjourns, there's what we would call a general public comment period where the guy who's concerned about his potholes on a street OK, that's when he has the opportunity to stand up and address the board. OK, that way the public comment period is a little more manageable. And because the Sunshine Act says that a board can establish reasonable rules for public comment, we think that's reasonable. OK, and these municipalities that have adopted it say it's working out for us. There's some municipalities that, you know, say oh, we don't really want to do that or we don't need to do that. That's fine. I just want to reiterate, this is not a requirement of the act, OK, but it is permissible given the language that allows you to establish reasonable rules. Now, when we talk about reasonable rules, you know, like having time limits, uh, you know, we're going to establish a policy where we only allow three minutes for public comment. Again, maybe something comes up special uh, of special import for this public meeting so the board can vote. We're going to set this aside for this evening so everyone has five minutes for public comment or whatever. OK, it's all reasonable uh, as long as the rules that you're establishing do not go against the spirit of the Sunshine Act and the public's right to comment. Occasionally we will see uh, some really bizarre ones that, you know, uh, I, I don't want to get into the heads of board members as to why they're establishing this. But when you take a couple steps back and look at it, it's like you're really throwing cold water on the public's ability to comment before you vote on these issues. So you want to be, you know, somewhat careful about it. Another one is asking groups to appoint a spokesperson. Uh, let's say that some particularly uh, hot topic issue is coming up for a vote at tonight's meeting. A bunch of people show up. They all have the same T-shirts on with, you know, a comment or, or picture on the front and they all sign up for public comment. OK, now it, it, the potential is number one, you're going to be there all night. Number two, there's probably going to be a lot of repetition. There is absolutely nothing preventing the chairperson from approaching that group and saying, look, you know, I suspect you're all here. And in order to just organize the meeting and public comment a little better, how would you feel about appointing a spokesperson? And we'll give that person like 10 minutes instead of the normal three minutes to address the board to make sure that everything gets covered. All right. How would you feel about that? And, you know, they, they might very well agree to it. And that would save yourselves a lot of time and a lot of uh, uh, monotony with listening to the same comments over and over. OK, you can do that. You can do that. Uh, and then the other thing that I want to add here is that during public comment periods, you want to be careful about First Amendment rights. OK, now. Uh, People can't get up and, you know, start attacking people using vulgar language, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, they can get up and say some things that you may not agree with 
or some things that you may believe aren't relevant to the topic. All right, and recently there has been court activity where people who were shut down during public comment periods went to the federal courts and were successful in pleading the case that, you know, my First Amendment rights were violated. So, you know, if you're attending here today from the agency side, you know, I'm just cautioning you, cautioning you to be careful because there are certain limits as to what you can do to uh, limit public comment. And, you know, maybe you want to uh, talk to your solicitor and get up to speed on that in case you're considering any possible limitations on what people can address or how they can address uh, the board during public comment period. Only putting that out there for the good of the order because it is a, uh, a recent topic uh, that's, that's uh, come to light. Okay, I promise you we would talk about executive sessions. Executive sessions are gatherings of the board outside of public meetings where they need to discuss issues that are sensitive and kind of of a confidential nature. So an executive session can be held before, during, or after, immediately after an open meeting, or they can be announced for some future time that is not necessarily contiguous with a public meeting. When the board notifies the public that an executive session is either going to take place or uh, has taken place, they need to give the reason why they met in executive session. And here's where we're talking about that Reading Eagle case. In, in this particular case, the uh, city of Reading uh, city council had the chairman had the habit of saying, okay, we're going into executive session for personnel reasons or for legal reasons, okay? The Reading Eagle, which is the local newspaper said, well, that's not good enough. And they took them to court and were successful with it. And essentially, like I was saying earlier with talking about the agenda items, you need to give enough reason so that the person understands you're meeting for a valid reason to go into executive session. So maybe it's like we're going into executive session to discuss whether or not uh, it's appropriate to discipline an employee for an alleged rules violation, or we're going into executive session to discuss uh, our strategy regarding uh, a case that's been filed in the county court uh, with XYZ Corporation against the city or the borough or the township or whatever. All right. Maybe you want to give them the docket number or the, the title of the case, something like that. OK, but you have to provide enough of a reason so that a person understands, OK, that's a good reason. OK, and it makes sense. Now, when you're in executive session, there's no requirement for keeping minutes. Uh, and if you do keep minutes, uh, there's an exemption within the right to know law that removes them from being a public record. During an executive session, the board can take no official action. You can deliberate, you can kind of poll unofficially, but any decision that is the result of an executive session must be memorialized through an official vote during the public meeting. So maybe you decide it's appropriate to suspend this employee for three days uh, during the executive session. You come out of executive session, reconvene the public meeting, and then you take the official vote. And that becomes part of the official record. If you fail to do that, then chances are whatever you decided during executive session would be considered null and void. Okay, the reasons for executive session are listed in the Sunshine Act itself. Personnel matters, discussing labor negotiations, uh, that would usually be, you know, for a unionized or, or licensed bargaining unit. Uh, considering purchasing, leasing, or selling a property. The law does not say selling a property, but there is an unpublished Commonwealth Court decision where the court reasoned that selling a property should apply to the Sunshine Act. Consulting with counsel about litigation consulting with counsel about privileged information where, where your solicitor is providing legal guidance, um, discussing university admission standards. I don't know, I guess you'd have to be around in the 1950s when they wrote the law to understand why that's in there, 
or discussing emergency preparedness like homeland security. Now, I want to come back to personnel matters because this does not address or does not relate to um, personnel policy. OK, discussions about personnel policy must occur in a public meeting. However, if you are discussing a specific position or a specific employee, that is appropriate for executive session. All right, but a group of employees as a class that would occur in a public meeting. All right, someone asked earlier about violations. Number one, during a meeting, if a member of the public believes the board is violating the Sunshine Act, they can stand up in a courteous manner and say, I believe this is a violation. OK, and then sit back down. The board can either agree with them or not. If they agree, the board can then cure the violation, meaning no harm, no foul. Let's say that they mistakenly took a vote during executive session and didn't do it during the public meeting. All right. Public can stand up and say, hey, you took this action but didn't vote on it. OK, that's a violation of the Sunshine Act. The board can say, you know what, you're right. We got distracted. We forgot about that. OK, we'll take the vote now. They've cured the violation. The Sunshine Act allows them to do that. But what if they disagree? OK, and decide, no, we're just going to keep on going. All right, well, fine. The public, the, the member of the public did what they're allowed to do. They sit down and be quiet. After the meeting has adjourned, if that person is so inclined, they can now approach within 30 days for a local agency, approach their county court of common pleas and seek legal relief. Or if they believe that there is some sort of criminal culpability, they can also go to their district attorney. The district attorney will investigate any criminal aspects of the accusation. The court will address the Sunshine Act aspects of the alleged violation. And, you know, depending on how it's presented and what's being sought, the judge may have a hearing. Um, and then let's say that the, uh, you know, the judge decides that there has in fact been a violation. They have a rather broad range of solutions. They can simply say to the board, don't do it again, or they can void the vote that took place. They can void an entire meeting. Or if they believe it's particularly egregious, they can uh, levy fines. The fines go against the individual board members, not the agency. So the agency cannot pay the fines. Um, the, it comes out of the pocket of the individual board members. It's up to $1,000 for the first violation, up to $2,000 for the second violation. Okay, so questions have come up here. Um, all right, how do you enforce limiting comments from the public that shame public officials and or residents such as name calling, cry babies, lazy and so forth? Okay, I, I think number one is that you can have, like I said, reasonable rules to control public comment. What you're coming up against is, you know, name calling is one thing, uh, abuse is something else. So I think you've actually got to use, you know, you've got to take a look at the terms that are being used and kind of determine where that line is. When does someone cross the line? Uh, and, and there is case law, especially at the federal level when it comes to First Amendment cases, uh, that will help explain where that line is. Calling someone a crybaby or calling someone lazy does not cross that line. Okay, so you want to, again, have that discussion with your solicitor. Uh, who I think can provide good guidance on that to know when it is appropriate to shut someone down with the public comment. Okay, next question. What are the rules on making minutes available to the public? Okay, there you want to look at the right to know law. Uh, but let's talk about that because I cover this a little bit in the next slide. And it's miscellaneous provisions. Okay, minutes. 
the right to know, or I'm sorry, the Sunshine Act says that the board must keep minutes, all right? And that's all the detail that it goes into. Specific details on how you keep that may be defined by your, by your code, borough code, township code, school district uh, uh, rules and procedures and so forth. But at the very least, you must keep minutes. Now, let's move over to the right to know law. Well, well, first off hand, it also says that the minutes must reflect the date, time and place of the meeting, uh, what members of the board were in attendance, what came up for vote and how did that vote happen? I, I mean, how did that vote result? What was the result of it? So that it could be motion passed, motion was uh, defeated. If there is an individual roll call, then you must put down how each member of the board voted. OK, but again, you want to defer back to your your appropriate code to define what happens to those minutes once they're created. As far as the right to know law goes, the minutes are considered draft until the next regularly scheduled meeting of the board, at which point they become a permanent public record and are accessible under the right to know law. You can publish draft minutes. OK, there's nothing preventing you from doing that, but you do not have to do that. At the next board meeting, whether the board votes to approve the minutes or not, they become a public record accessible through the right to know law. OK, so that's how all that works. Now, a uh, question has come up. Meetings used to be video and audio recorded. Minutes have since been scribed and filed. Do we still have to keep these recordings? Yeah, that's the next part of what I want to talk about here. If your meeting is recorded by the board, that recording is a public record under the right to know law. And let's say you simply record the meeting for purposes of generating accurate minutes. Under what's called the Municipal Records Act that would apply to municipalities, you would keep the recording until the minutes have been approved at which time then you could discard the recording. So you see how we've got, you know, at least two other laws here that come into play with the Sunshine Act in dealing with minutes. But hopefully I've answered your question on that. If you are not subject to the Municipal Records Act, like for instance, school districts, there's, there's no law that I'm aware of that governs the retention of records for school districts, okay? Zoning hearing boards would fall under the uh, the Municipal Zoning Act or, you know, whatever that's particular called. I think it's the Municipal Planning Code. OK, so you want to look at that as far as records retention and access. Um, that would that's how that would work. OK, so back to our slide here to wrap up. We were talking about recordings. Well, what about the public? The Sunshine Act allows the public to record public meetings unannounced. Meaning I can, for instance, take my smartphone, set it on record, put it in my pocket, walk into the public meeting, and I don't have to tell anyone. There is no expectation of privacy during a public meeting. So a board member can't say, well, this is off the record or a member of the public during public comment can say, I don't want this recorded, okay? You can do that unannounced. Um, if the board is, well, really what I recommend is for the chairperson during the initial announcements to say, it is possible that this meeting is being recorded. There's no expectation of privacy. So you just need to be aware that your comments, you know, could be used elsewhere. OK, ZHB, uh, I'm not sure what that means with your question. Oh, zoning hearing board. Can the public record zoning hearing board meetings? OK, um, you want to distinguish between what would be a, yeah, thanks, what, what would be a business meeting versus a hearing? Because there is other, there are other statutes that dictate the operations of a zoning hearing board uh, and I don't know the specifics as to whether they can be recorded or not. I do know that typically during a hearing, 
there is a stenographer present who may or may not be using a, a recording device. So I would say check with your zoning hearing board, take a look at the statute that governs hearings as opposed to public meetings. Sunshine Act, which we're talking about here today, public meetings, zoning hearing boards, and the hearings in particular are governed by a different statute, which I'm just not an expert on. Okay, so, and then we talked about the recordings and the minutes of public meetings are considered public records and how that all works with the uh, right to know law. Okay, they are accessible under the right to know law. Okay, so we are at the end of our presentation. If you have any further questions, now's the time to get them in. In the meantime, I'd like to encourage you to take a look at our website. If you've participated in any of our other webinars, you know what I'm about to say. This is the best government website you will ever encounter. It's updated six days a week with new information on government transparency, decisions of the Office of Open Records, relevant court decisions, training opportunities, and the like. Go to our website and you will find, you know, a citizen's guide that covers uh, aspects of the right to know law that you'd want to know about, agency guides about the right to know law. We've got a specific page on the Sunshine Act with FAQs that you'd want to take a look at. Um, training opportunities, our training calendar, again, uh, to see what's going on as far as our schedule. Um, there's also opportunities, like I was talking about earlier, that if you have questions, you can submit them by email or call our office. And, you know, we cannot write write to no requests for you. We can't respond on behalf of agencies, uh, but we can kind of steer you in the right direction with these issues. All right, so you've had some really good questions. Oh, here's another one. Can commissions and councils meet without the public to discuss items? items that are not at that time going on to the board with recommendations. In general, Lori, the answer would be no. If they are deliberating about agency business, even though there's no expectation that they're going to be voting on it, that deliberation would move the level of discussion to where it should be occurring at a public meeting, okay? Um, that's one of the standards that we use. Is it a meeting? Well, is there deliberation taking place? The definition of deliberation is discussion that could lead to a vote, not will, but could. So if it is a matter of agency business that ultimately could lead to a decision, that's deliberation and deliberation must occur in a public setting during a public meeting that is subject to the Sunshine Act. Hopefully I've addressed that. Okay, any other questions before we finish up? All right, well, again, thank you for uh, your participation today. We had some really good questions that uh, had me thinking. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I wanna invite you to participate in future webinars and future training opportunities. And, uh, you know, just have a good week out there. And hopefully we'll see you at another session in the future. We're gonna log off. Take care.